And I've come to the conclusion that really it would have been far easier to have had two wives to have covered both sides of the street. <laughs> and I could have walked down the middle directing the operation. Did it cross either of your minds that um, in three years' time you would be announcing your engagement, thinking of getting Not married? No. no. Hello, good morning. Well, the big day has arrived. In four hours' time, Charles Philip Arthur George Mountbatten Windsor marries Diana Frances Spencer, and Britain and the world will celebrate the wedding of the Prince and Princess of Wales. At the end of a very long red carpeted corridor, I notice this ball of white racing towards me, and I realized it was Princess Diana. She'd rolled her train up into a ball, tucked it under her arm, she had her slippers in one hand, and she was racing down this corridor, lined with windows. And the diamonds of the Spencer family tiara were glinting in the sunshine. What a picture of hope and happiness and love. She had it all. Do you find it a very daunting experience that uh, yesterday you were a nanny looking after children? Um, now you're about to uh, marry the Prince of Wales, and, and one day you would, all, in all likelihood, be queen. It's a tremendous change for someone, if I may say, of 19 to make all of a sudden, the transition. It is, but I've had a small run up to it all in the last six months. <laughs> and next to Prince Charles and I can't go wrong. It was difficult for me to tread the path between Prince Charles and Princess Diana. Now Diana arrived every weekend with the boys on Friday afternoon and left every Sunday. But someone else occupied that space in between. And I learned to serve two royal mistresses. <laughs> now if you watch that, that piece of footage when Prince Charles is asked, are you in love, sir? And I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> and she looks at him as if to say, what are you talking about? Don't you know what love is? That was the problem from the beginning. Charles didn't really know what love was. He never really wanted a lover. He wanted a mother. The Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles are about to come out now. <laughs> the Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles seen together in public quite clearly, coming down the steps of the Ritz after the party for Cam the 50th birthday party for Camilla's sister. No secret about their relationship now, none possible at all. The photograph that people have waited so long, the picture that people have waited so long to see. The princess was locked in a loveless marriage, hurt by her husband's continued friendship with an old flame, Camilla Parker Bowles. One, Princess of Wales, and the other, Mrs. Parker Wells. It was 1977 that Charles came to stay as a friend of my sister Sarah's uh, for a shoot. We sort of met in a ploughed field. <laughs> well, I remember thinking what a very jolly and amusing and, and attractive 16-year-old she was. 
and having great fun mm. and bouncy and full of life and everything. And um, um, I don't know what you thought of me. But... Pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I think if Princess Diana and Prince Charles had been ordinary people, they'd have probably got divorced a lot sooner than they eventually did. Are you planning for the future? You must be planning for the future, where you're going to live and this sort of thing? You talk oh, yes, yes, yes. I mean, I've got uh, this house in Gloucestershire, which I acquired uh, last year. With marriage in mind? No, no, not really. I mean, I, I did want somewhere very much as a base, and uh, I wanted somewhere which was nearer to... Uh, the Duchy of Cornwall areas that I could reach then and visit people and look at the farms and things. And um, so that was very convenient. But obviously, um, it's, it's been a great help. Madam, how are you enjoying married life? How do you recommend it? How do you like to go for moral as a place? Lovely. You had yeah. this period of several years where they were sleeping in separate bedrooms. Apparently, post-1986, they were leading rather separate lives, not just staying in different rooms, but on different floors of the palace. But even still, the princess tried to make her marriage work, and she never actually wanted a divorce. What were the expectations that you had for married life? I think like any marriage, especially when you've had uh divorced parents like myself, you'd want to try even harder to make it work and you don't want to fall back into a pattern that you've seen happen in your own family. I desperately wanted to work. I, I desperately love my husband and I wanted to share everything together. And I thought that we were a very good team. She said, I'll have a separation, but I don't want to be divorced. For the children's sake, I want us to remain a family unit, to bring them up as parents. There's a lot to be done. It's going to be marvellous to, to have somebody to, to help sort it out. As Lady Diana's uh, father described her this morning as, uh, he said he thought she'd make a very good housewife. I was not <laughs> <he> said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've yet to see. <laughs> But she is pretty as you expected her to be. Oh, prettier than ever. More prettier than ever. Diana didn't have the happiest of, of childhoods. Her parents separated when she was younger, um, so she came from a broken home, and I think perhaps there was an insecurity that a seed was sown from a young age, um, and that insecurity was something that flourished actually within her as she got older. The couple had arrived separately at St. Paul's, but a crowd of about 3,000 had built up, their enthusiasm unmistakable. Prince Charles was so relaxed, he nearly came to grief on the top step. 
And when it was over, all the stress of the last few days evaporated as Prince Charles clasped Lady Diana's hand reassuringly and unaffectedly. She seemed to recover all her old charm and poise, sitting close beside him as they drove off together. Just as Charles fell immediately in love with Princess Diana, or Lady Diana Spencer as she was at the time, so, so too did Britain. We hadn't seen the likes of a, a future princess like this for many, many years, and Diana was just a stunner. I mean, that picture that Arthur Edwards took of her coming out of her nursery in that see-through dress, that set of pins that she sported, the innocence about her, you just thought, wow, this girl is knockout. There was a huge interest from, from the moment the engagement happened. Um, everyone watched the engagement footage. Everyone around the world, pretty much, tuned into the royal wedding. I mean, that was, a, that was a huge event in 81. Before he left home, Lord Spencer, the proudest of men today, wanted a few words. I just like to say a word. May I say a word? Yes, yes. Um, the Spencers have, through the centuries, fought for their king and country. Today, Diana, is vying to help her country for the rest of her life. She will be following in the tradition of her ancestors, and she will have at her side the man she loves. I wasn't daunted, and I'm, I'm not daunted by the responsibilities that that role creates. Um, it was a challenge. It is a challenge. Um, as for becoming queen, it was never uh, at the forefront of my mind when I married my husband. It was a long way off, that thought. And then, just after half past 10, from Clarence House came the glass coach, and our first chance to see Lady Diana, dress half glimpsed, veil tantalizingly lowered. It was the fairy tale wedding. The princess made a fatal mistake. She fell in love with her prince. In the very beginning, she totally adored him. And so Lady Diana, in that truly stunning dress, is well and truly launched on her way to the cathedral. Because this is the moment where she could exercise that traditional bride's prerogative of being late. But somehow, I don't think she will. I saw correspondence between them. I saw correspondence from the princess to the queen, which said how happy she was, and how she loved to be a wife, and how much she would support Charles in, in his future career. They were her views, but times changed. In the beginning, she was a shy, naive, quiet girl who knew nothing about the world. She was thrown in at the deep end and told to swim. Well, I think now when we reflect on it and after we've seen interviews that Diana gave subsequently, we know that she was extremely ill-prepared for married life into the royal family and she felt enormous pressure from day one, even when they were discussing the engagement and the wedding plans, I think the pressure started to build on her. Lady Diana was back at the Pimlico kindergarten where she teaches this morning, but polite as ever, she was saying nothing about her weekend with Prince Charles at Sandringham to the assembled press corps. The media scrutiny of Lady Di as she was then, I think, uh, played foremost on her mind. She didn't know how she needed to behave. And when she actually entered married life, she found it a very lonely experience. Charles was off enjoying his country pursuits and she felt that she was left rather in a world she didn't recognise, a modern woman in quite an old school environment of Buckingham Palace, uh, essentially feeling like a spare part. Well, Diana 
made it very clear that she felt like a fish out of water. Even before her actual wedding, she said she spent those nights before um, her wedding at Clarence House, which was then the Queen Mother's residence. And uh, the night before her wedding was one of the most miserable of her life. Um, she recalls how she felt completely isolated. You know, the images of the princess trapped in the tower. I think she felt isolated and uh, I don't think that the palace were prepared for someone who perhaps didn't have that royal training to marry in to the royal family and to become a future queen. She was the Princess of Wales, she became famous overnight and she didn't really have the tools to equip her for such immediate stardom. I think there was an acceptance from Diana that she was going to be one of the world's most photographed women and she actually grew in that role and became more confident with the press. I think she found her role as the world's most photographed woman both suppressing but kind of a revelation to her in that she had this ability to perhaps manipulate the media, have a bit of a laugh and joke with photographers and reporters alike and equally use this global presence for good and that's how she got into her charitable work. Ladies and gentlemen, I will not delay you long, but I would like to add a few words about Turning Point from my own personal observation. On the basis of available statistics, there could be several people here tonight who will reach a state of mental imbalance in the next year or so. Those who feel most immune may be the least secure, especially in this chameleon world. A crisis might be triggered up by the breakup of a marriage, the loss or change of a job, or the trial of an accident or bereavement. Eating disorders, whether it be anorexia or bulimia, show how an individual can turn the nourishment of the body into a painful attack on themselves. The depression was resolved, as you say, but it was subsequently reported that you suffered bulimia. Mm. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. I had bulimia for a number of years. And that's like a secret disease you inflicted upon yourself because your self-esteem was to low ebb and you don't think you're worthy or valuable. Do you know, I think the princess's problems stem from childhood. I think because she was abandoned as a child, because her mother ran away to Australia when Diana was young, I think the princess felt as if she wasn't good enough. James Hewitt came along at a time when the princess was first looking for someone to love. I have no comment. No comment, I'm afraid. Will you be prepared to make a comment to us later on in the day? No, I have no comment. He just happened to be there. He just happened to be a dashing cavalry officer. He just happened to push all the right buttons. I have to tell you, he was there after Prince Harry was born, not before Prince Harry was born. Because there's a great myth in the world that people think that Harry is James Hewitt's son. That's impossible. She didn't know James Hewitt at that time. You have to look at the chronological order of the way things happened. <laughs> Good. I'm going off here. That's enough. Thanks. Thank you. So Harry was born. Prince Charles had told her, I don't love you. I only married you to have children. She then begins to look for someone to love. And James Hewitt was there. I was the one she trusted. No one else knew of this relationship, and I would ferry him to and from Highgrove from Kemble Railway Station in the back of my car and take him back to the train station when they'd had tea or he'd spent the night. But this was a real big secret. The other big secret I was keeping was, of course, Prince Charles was seeing Camilla Parker Bowles. No one knew. The world didn't know at that stage. For the first few years, it seemed this royal honeymoon would never end. But behind the scenes, it was all very different.
The princess's popularity gave the royal family a new lease of life. Modernization is a very hard word to use in the context of the royal family because the royal family is built on history and tradition and protocol. And, um, you know, Diana really broke the mold. She did things differently. She enjoyed life, you know, she, had, she was a vibrant person, uh, she was charming, she was the daughter of an earl, she'd been married. Well, she was just 20 years old when she got married and uh, her life had been very prescribed for her within the royal family. But nevertheless, she still asserted herself and after she got used to being a princess, she became more and more her own person. And um, uh, that's what people loved about her. In the early days, Diana's light was small, but he began to shine brighter and brighter and brighter. And he was a sort of a star is born situation. Prince Charles would say to her, while I married you, I made you a princess. You weren't born royal. This is a man who has been born to be king. This is a man who has been treated from the very beginning as a god, suddenly being eclipsed by this woman he wasn't very happy. Well, I think Princess Diana, like the rest of the world, was caught up in the fairy tale that was her own royal relationship. And I think very quickly the reality set in that she didn't have much in common with Prince Charles. And actually, they were very different people with very different interests. And that's when the cracks started appearing. It's a tremendous change for someone, if I may say, of 19 to make all of a sudden the transition. It is, but I've had a small run out to it all in the last six months. <laughs> and next to Prince Charles and I can't go wrong. He's there with me. Did you try to be faithful and honourable to your wife when you took on the vow of marriage? Yes, absolutely. And you were? Yes. Until it became irretrievably broken down us both having tried. The Prince of Wales had just been on TV to admit adultery with Camilla Parker Bowles. And the princess of that evening was due to go out to the Serpentine Gallery to see her old friend, Lord Palumbo, and open his new exhibition. I can't go. I'm not going. I'm not going. It'll be too humiliating. The whole world now knows that Charles has been having an affair. He's admitted it. You are going, I said. I've got nothing to wear. Yes, you have got something to wear. I went up to her wardrobe room and picked out a Christina Strombolian dress with a fishtail. This is what you're gonna wear, I said. High heels and those jewels. Remember, when you go out there, I said, you stride, you hold your head high. You smile, you engage, firm handshake. Say to yourself, I am Diana, Princess of Wales, and I am here to stay. I am the mother of the future King of England. Say it to yourself. Say it. The announcement that Camilla Parker Bowles and her husband are to divorce has reignited speculation over the marriage of the Prince and Princess of Wales. According to the Prince's authorised biography, he and Mrs Parker Bowles have had three affairs over a period of more than 20 years. Today's announcement led one noted royal watcher to speculate that any move now by Prince Charles to divorce and marry Mrs Parker Bowles could imperil the monarchy.
The admission made the front pages and prompted this question. Someone other than Diana could be queen one day. The Prince of Wales has made it clear that he has no intention of remarrying once his divorce comes through. In a statement, he was attempting to quash speculation that he might marry Camilla Parker Bowles, the woman he's admitted having an affair with. This followed last night's disclosure that the Queen had written to the Prince and Princess of Wales suggesting an early divorce. I think this morning's papers are the beginning of a vox pop process, which seems to me to be indicating that the British people would very reluctantly accept Mrs. Parker Bowles as a substitute for Diana as a future queen. Today, Prince Charles was keeping a long distance from the cameras as he left Scotland after a weekend at Balmoral, together with his two sons. In the latest extract from Jonathan Dimbleby's biography in today's Sunday Times, it's claimed that he's had three separate affairs with Camilla Parker Bowles. She was today also keeping a low profile, spending the weekend with her husband at their home in Wiltshire. Three calls within three weeks could all be captured on tape by radio hands. I mean, as, I, as I've said before, it is a deeply regrettable thing to happen. But... Uh, it does happen, and unfortunately, in this case, it has happened. I mean, it's the last possible thing that I ever wanted to happen. I'm not a total idiot. I do, I'm not unaware of all these um, problems. And as I was saying before, this business of predicting what everybody would say, it's not something that I went into marriage, you know, with the intention of this happening. Camilla Parker Bowles, whose relationship with the Prince of Wales was confirmed last year, is to divorce. Mrs Parker Bowles and her husband issued a statement this morning saying they'd grown apart in recent years and had little of common interest left in their lives. You see, Camilla Parker Bowles has been that ghost always there throughout the princess's life. So, Princess Diana didn't stand a chance, really. She tried, but then she failed. And after Harry was born, Prince Charles told her, I never really loved you, and now I'm going back to Camilla. The only secret Diana ever kept from me was the Martin Bashir interview for Panorama. Now, I'd known Martin Bashir for a long time, and he was one of the men that I used to bring into the palace under a blanket because he didn't want to be seen by anyone. He was never a lover of the princesses. He was just a work associate. He persuaded the princess that she had to have a voice. She needed to tell her story. And what better a vehicle than Panorama? I was sent home on a Sunday afternoon. Strange, I thought. Why would she be sending me home? Go and spend some time with your family. I'm doing nothing this afternoon. Don't worry about me. The minute I'd left the palace, in through the back door comes Martin Bashir and his camera crew, and they set up the, the Prince of Wales sitting room, which she used for that interview. At the age of 19, you always think you're prepared for everything and you think you have the knowledge of what's coming ahead. But although I was daunted at the prospect at the time, I felt I had the support of my husband to be. I had no idea that was being done. The next morning I came to work, I noticed all the furniture had been moved. Why have you moved the furniture? It's not in the same place. Um, I had a dance class. I had to move the furniture out of the way just so that we could exercise. Strange. Very strange. She avoided me for the next two days, never spoke to me. How strange, I thought, she's hiding something. And then she told me that she made a recording with Martin Bashir for Panorama. What have you said? Well, I just put the record straight, she said. We didn't know what she said until we saw it. Well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. <laughs> 
31 million people stopped in their tracks on that Monday night and couldn't believe what they were seeing. The Princess of Wales bearing her heart on national television. We couldn't take our eyes away from it. We couldn't believe what we were hearing. There are three people in my marriage. My husband isn't fit for the top job. I don't, I think it would be, bring him limitations. She was honest, open and frank. Did you love James Hewitt? Yes, it did. Yes. Were you unfaithful? Yes, I adored him. Yes, I was in love with him. But I was very let down. It was all there. I, I couldn't believe it. It was too raw for most people and an embarrassment for the royal family. That was the final straw. That was the straw that broke the back of the House of Windsor. From that moment on, Diana was outcast. Her titles were stripped. She was no longer prayed for in church. She was on her own. Life with Diana was 24-7. My wife said, there are three people in my marriage too, because Diana is always there. She used to say, she's your baby. I said, yes, she's my baby. She needs me. She needs me to be there. My wife had two children. The princess had no one. Her children were away at boarding school. She had no husband. Occasionally, she had a male companion, but they came and they went. I was responsible for that too. I was a go-between. I was the one that went out with my car, brought people back to Kensington Palace in the back seat of my car underneath a blanket, just to give the princess some love. All she was ever looking for was to be loved. She used to say to me, all I ever want, Paul, is to someone, a man to put their arms around me and say, I love you. That's not too much to ask, is it? And that's what she was searching for. Her soulmate was Hasnut Khan, the heart surgeon. Diana, when she came to Pakistan, this was a country that she had fond memories of, wasn't it? Yes, I think she enjoyed her uh, time here. Um, she really liked the days she spent here, I think. And meeting your family, uh, that must have been a special moment for her and for them. Uh, I think it definitely was for my family. And I think she enjoyed the afternoon tea with them. I think that's uh, a long time ago now. 1996, I think. I remember the day the princess met Hasnat Khan. She came back from the hospital, having visited children on the ward, and she said the most astonishing things happened to me today. As we sat down, she told me about this meeting. She said I was going up in the elevator and somebody put their foot into the elevator door as it was closing and it opened again. And there he was. This gorgeous man was staring at me. Well, who wouldn't stare at Princess Diana? Surrounded by a gaggle of students, Hasnett was on his rounds around the hospital. And there he was, face to face with the princess for the first time. And she said, I knew then, I knew I would have a relationship with him. Our chemistry was so strong that I knew. Of course, their relationship was nearly two years in the making. Two years, no one knew about him. Again, I was the go-between. I would bring him into the palace. I'd ask chef to cook dinner for two. I'd wait dinner for two. I'd make sure they were comfortable before I went home. And in the morning, I'd take him back in the boot of my car to the hospital. So the police never saw him. The chefs never saw him. The maids never saw him. And no one saw him, just me. I don't know how she'll find her husband, but um, I, I always imagined she'd, she'd end up with someone older, very powerful and rich, perhaps a sort of Anassas type figure that really could look after her and whisk her away from everything. 
in the same way that, that Anassas did for, for Jacqueline Kennedy. I hope you can find it in your hearts to understand and to give me the time and space that has been lacking in recent years. Hasnat Khan had been the princess's companion for over two years. Nobody knew about Hasnat Khan. That was not played out on the world stage. Whereas, after they'd broken up, the princess was invited to the south of France by the Mohammed Al Fayeds. She met Dodi Al Fayed. Did you know that the romance of the princess and Dodi al Fayed was 30 days from beginning to end? It only lasted 30 days. I spoke to her regularly when she was away. Have you seen Hasnet? I said, yes, I went for a drink with him last night. What does he think of my, me being here in the south of France with Dodi al Fayed? Well, he's not too pleased. Has he seen the pictures in the papers? Yes, he has, because you know his routine. You know every morning he goes to the corner shop and sees the press. You know that. And I know that's what you're doing. You're manipulating the world's media by having these pictures taken to show Hasnet who you're with. It's sort of a... Are you jealous? Do you mind? Do you care? Are you bothered? That's what... Diana was saying to Hasnat Khan through those pictures in the world's media. And of course, Hasnat was bothered. The marriage problems of Charles and Diana have cast a shadow over the royal family. Now the Queen has decided to bring the whole issue to a head by advising them to divorce. 
Part of the Queen's concern is the continuing effect on Prince Harry and Prince William of their parents' marital troubles, which were brought out so starkly and so publicly in the Princess's Panorama TV interview. It's understood Prince Charles, seen here recently with his sons at Eton, shares his mother's view that a divorce is now desirable. There are no constitutional implications for Prince Charles himself. He remains heir to the throne and will in due course succeed under the Act of Settlement. There was a change of the, of the rules which govern how divorces were conducted last autumn. Uh, and that change provided that you no longer needed to name the person with whom the other spouse had committed adultery. This morning, Princess Diana was at her gym again. The photographers weren't happy. Very funny, Mum! The legal discussions are not likely to be straightforward. There do not appear to be any arguments over the custody of Prince William and Prince Harry, but Princess Diana does seem determined to secure a good financial settlement. The Queen, here attending today's Gulf War memorial service at St Paul's Cathedral in London, had been awaiting Diana's decision since last December. Then she wrote to both Prince Charles and Diana, advising them that it was in their best interest to seek an early divorce. The Queen took the unusual step of intervening in what became a public manner. The entrance to the Princess's London home tonight. She's said to be inside Kensington Palace, very sad and very pensive, according to friends. The press pack is gathering at the gates of Kensington Palace this evening, but the Princess of Wales has turned camera shy ahead of tomorrow's panorama screening. The prince now faces some difficult choices. Should he seek a divorce? Should he marry Mrs. Parker Bowles? With regard to the Princess of Wales, if there is a divorce, uh, then she will not be queen. Lawyers say the divorce issue could still go to court. I think she's playing a clever game. I think she is uh, aware absolutely of what she is doing. She's convinced she ought to have a, an ambassadorial role, and that is what the public wants. And she's convinced that by doing this, she's going to make sure her husband realizes that. You've been very open about all of this and what you've, what you've said. Do you now hope that this issue and expect this issue to go away. Would, is that what you hope will now happen? Yeah. Do you think die, die was worth it? Yeah. Is this die worth 17 million? You can still come in, can't you? I mean, would you pay your wife 17 million if you got divorced? Yeah. Oh, well, I'd probably, if I had it, I would, yeah. I was surprised at that. I thought it was a very peculiar way of doing it. On the face of it, it was rather discourteous to the Queen. But Princess Diana is very good at manipulating the media and it may well be that she did it like this to show that she could do her own thing and also to give her a stronger bargaining power over the title that she wanted to have and perhaps over the nature of the divorce settlement when it comes. Behind closed gates at Kensington Palace, the princess was said to be deeply upset at making and declaring the decision to end the marriage. It could happen swiftly, meaning a leap year divorce. So as the public read the papers, the royal lawyers set about reading the small print. What has yet to be worked out are the complicated details of a divorce. She's got the house, Kensington Palace, which Prince Charles has always wanted to get back because he's stuck, poor fellow, in St. James's Palace. And she has got the children, and obviously there's nothing going to change. She's got the money from Charles to keep up her lifestyle. And so in those early days, she had so little self-confidence. She didn't believe in herself. And I think that love lost in those early days haunted her through her life. She was always searching to be loved. She was always wanting to embrace people. And I remember when I got married, she came and sat in my kitchen, hitched herself up onto the draining board on the sink with her legs dangling, looked at me and said, do you know, this is all I've ever wanted, a happy family life. And that's the one thing that she could never have. So that love with Prince Charles that 
she gave everything for disappeared and she turned around and there was no one there. The most beautiful woman in the world had no one to hold her. She had no one to kiss her goodnight. She had no one to say, how beautiful you look. Obviously, it would be nice if, you know, if it could be over and done with. I mean, it has happened. That is, that is that, regrettably.